is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, we have two special guests on today's show. Later this hour, we'll be speaking to the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, as we approach one year since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We'll also discuss U.S.-China tensions and Russia's suspension of a nuclear arms treaty. That interview at 9.30 a.m. London time. But first, our next guest runs one of the largest investment management firms in the world. Brookfield has more, has nearly or has more than $800 billion in assets under management. Based in Toronto, the firm has become a major global player in alternative asset management investments, especially since spinning off 25% of Brookfield asset management last December. So for a lengthy and robust conversation, I am delighted to be joined by the Brookfield Asset Management Chief Executive Officer. He's Bruce Flat. Bruce, so good to good finally morning. speak to you morning, in Francine. person and here in London. Talk to me about how fundraising and go. When you look at markets, when you look at some of the pitfalls in the economy inflation, how's it feeling out there? You know, I, I would say we raised 100 billion last year. We'll probably raise 100 billion this year. And, uh, and the difference is many of our things today, many of the things we do, are backbone global infrastructure. And these are what people want to own. They're benefiting or they're positively disposed to inflation uh, in infrastructure and in renewables in private credit and uh, and these are products that people want to own so there's money still flowing in in significant ways there are there are some areas yep. of the business which uh, money isn't flowing in as robustly good news is we're not in most of those and technology be the biggest one that uh, people are having effects with so of course if you have to get one thing right in terms of capital allocation that's inflation and which is why infrastructure is is a great place to be right now where, where do you see capital being deployed specifically in infrastructure there's always a timeline problem right of yeah. how long these projects take look these are uh, these are incredible assets and the interesting thing is 20 years ago when we talked to clients about putting infrastructure into portfolios it was um, they looked at it and said they didn't really understand what it is after 20 years of showing resiliency growth and now through this period COVID where they weren't really affected and now being the positive effects with inflation um, people are allocating a lot of capital to them, but it co goes all across the spectrum from pipelines to uh, telecom towers to toll roads to, you know, all forms of infrastructure that we invest in around the world. And, and it uh, has really become a great investment class. Is there a part of the world where actually this will really, you know, come up even more, where it's a better investment to, to be present now in infrastructure? Look, I, I would say that... It, the biggest portion of the world uh, today is in the United States. It's the largest right. economy. Uh, that's where you find the most opportunities always. Um, but the emerging markets, uh, where you pick them selectively, um, are also a great places to invest. For example, we have a large telecom tower business in India where we own 160,000 towers, um, which span the whole country. And it's an incredible um, investment. And, uh, and so the build out of the backbone of the global economy continues in all these markets, but one must be careful with these type of investments. Um, Bruce, when you look at infrastructure in the U.S., and you know we talk about inflation day in, day out, about whether we can avoid a recession where the Fed actually crushes the economy to get to 2%, are you fairly confident that everything you're invested in the U.S. is, if not recession-proof, certainly something that, that you can manage? Y yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we will manage them all. We've been doing this a long time, and uh, we've come through cycles before. And this one, this one is, I think going to be relatively muted uh, on the recessionary side but one has to be careful and you know we, uh, you've never got every, nothing's ever perfect uh, in investing you make you make small mistakes along the way you learn you learn that way and uh, but I'd say the the US economy is coming through this well the good news is interest rates have gone up dramatically right and we've seen the worst of it like the worst has come now it all hasn't transmitted through the economy yet and that's happening but the worst of the, the medicine yeah. has been dealt out. And, uh, and, I, and I think we're just seeing the effects coming through now. So I'm, I'm surprised, actually, given the leverage that we're seeing, that there are not more companies either going bust or, or some kind of second round effect. Look, we had the financial crisis, uh, the banks through the financial crisis and the housing uh, issues in the United States um, were dealt with in a very positive way by the regulators and by the system. And as a result of that, um, I, we entered into this period as a system in pretty good shape. And, uh, and I think we all learned a lot through that period. 
those periods, and uh, and therefore um, uh, we don't I, we haven't seen many big issues. Um, Bruce, so I, I think it's very clear where you want to be invested in terms of themes, right? We we talked about infrastructure. You also focus on deglobalization. You focus on energy securities and others. Out of these themes, how do you, how do you play them? You know, look, our playbook is pretty simple. We buy great assets <clears throat> in great places uh, and invest um, for the long term. And the th those big themes of decarbonization in the world, <clears throat> deglobalization, just moving things back, and digitalization. Uh, everyone's phone is receiving enormous amounts of information today, and not many people stop to think, how did I get that information? Somebody had to build the backbone, and it used to be uh, we were building uh, gas connections to houses, and we still do. And we were building electricity connections to office buildings. Today, it's, we're building the backbone, the towers, the data warehouses, the fiber to the home, and all this backbone behind what comes onto your phone or your computer. And so you see opportunities there because maybe other parts of the market focus on the, on the new technology, on the AI. And so that looks expensive, whereas the backbone, the pipeline, as it were, is something that you still see value in. Yeah, it's just different. We're just okay. different. We own the backbone of the economy. We don't, we're not early stage venture investors. We are in a small way, but we're, we're not that type of investor. We put enormous amounts of money into backbone of the economy. And these are 10, 10 20, 30 billion dollars uh, investments, and they're very large, and, uh, and that's significant. Now, AI is benefiting all of these. When you think about it, the amount of storage capacity, therefore to come to your phone, the amount of storage capacity is enormous. So the use and the capacity that we have to build yep. for data warehouses, for the um, fiber to the home, for the, the uh, telecom towers, the amount of data that's stored on it is dramatically different than what it was before. So all of these things are just increasing exponentially the capacity required, which means that more money needs to go into infrastructure. So talk to me also about deglobalization. Now I was particularly interested in this theme because this touches everything, right? It, it touches how we play with China. Um, it touches on some of the emerging markets. Like how much more onshoring do you see in the world economy? Look, the, the, uh, there's two things going on. Uh, uh, international companies are, are moving some yeah. of their supply chain to other countries, um, and uh, I'd say India is one where uh, there's no doubt international companies are, are serious now about putting uh, more manufacturing capacity there. But on sophisticated supply chains for healthcare, pharmaceuticals, and semiconductors, and products like that, there's an enormous amount of money being invested yeah. and going to be invested. We, we just, uh, we announced last year a transaction with Intel yeah. where we're building um, with them, or ha we're, we're, we own half the, their plant in Arizona, and uh, this is a 30 plus billion dollar plant. Um, so it's a very significant reshoring of uh, semiconductor chips. Is, is India still a good opportunity? I know you were one of the earliest, I think, investors, or the most prominent investors. You don't have exposure to Adani, but does it change the psyche of investing in India? You know, I, look, I, I'd say uh, we were always careful uh, when we went to India. We built out, we spent a lot of time building out our own people and our own business, and we're in the market. And that's um, given us a great advantage to invest on our own, and uh, so I, we're still, we've done extremely well over the years. We have a great franchise there. We're still putting money into the market. And I'd say when we're normally, when capital is less uh, freely available, uh, it's better for us in the type of investing that we do. Because the entry point right. where you invest is often really important. And less capital available means less people are chasing it. Therefore, opportunities are better. And, and so you see that, do you see opportunities in the next 12 months? Yes. Okay. Yes. Look, I, the next 12 months are going to be an excellent investing environment. Um, a lot of people are negative. That means it's a great environment to invest. Uh, so we're going to continue to be putting money to work uh, in this environment. How much money? It's riskier also. You know, it's less risky. It seems, it always, this is why it's more, it always <laughs> seems like it's more risky. It's actually less risky. You know, to, just to make the point, equities uh, are down. Equity markets are down, which means that if you invest a dollar, it's, um, over the longer term, it's less risky. Fixed income is down, meaning interest rates are higher, therefore the, the probability of losing money is a lot less. Bitcoin is down. 
not that I'm investing in Bitcoin, <laughs> but growth stocks are down. Okay. So uh, everything has been, uh, has come down in the markets and that is, um, that, that's, that, that means that the returns going forward will be better, therefore the risk is less. Now it doesn't feel that way. It well, often it feels, feels choppy, doesn't it? It, it feels it, a little it, bit volatile. It just but, and and that's that's what's that's why it's a good market to invest in. All right, Bruce, don't go anywhere because we'll be back for our exclusive conversation with Brookfield Asset Management Chief Executive Bruce Flat. I'll also ask him if he's investing more or less money in China. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now we're back with Brookfield Asset Management Chief Executive Officer Bruce Flat. Bruce, thank you so much, first of all, for sticking around. Now you're explaining to me that g given some of retrenchment in markets, actually it's good opportunities for you and Brookfield. What does it mean for companies that you will either want to IPO or, or put out there? I know there are questions about what you do with some of the UK assets, in including centre parks. Yeah, look, our uh, our investments around the world. We we last year for perspective, we raised a hundred billion. Yep. We um, invested uh, fifty-five billion. We sold thirty-five billion of assets. This is a vast business. So we're always okay. buying things. We're sometimes selling things. And uh, the UK, we have a sixty billion dollar business. We have a lot of infrastructure, renewables, real estate, and uh, from time to time, we look at taking. It, it, an IPO is really just uh, a possible sale of an asset it, on block. It could go to somebody else or it could go into the markets. I wouldn't say the markets on an, for an IPO are attractive today, just given valuations in the market. Um, so you would wait for a more attractive market or do, would it, you know, strategically? Maybe you'll sense? sell to somebody else. You'd sell it in the private markets. Remember, price and value are two different things. Value is what the asset's worth and price is what it trades at in the market. Uh, today, it's better to be buying in the public markets than it is to be selling because prices often today, just given the volatility we just talked about it, price is often lower than value. Um, therefore, it's probably better to sell it in the private markets if you're going to yeah. sell it or you just wait. Yeah. So are you, are you looking to sell Central Parks? <laughs> you know, we, we look, we've owned it a, quite a long time. It's in a, it's in a fund which has a, a, and, uh, a life on it. It still has a long time to go. So sometime in the next five or seven years, we'll sell it at, a, at an opportune time. It's doing really, really well as a business, uh, as many we people know. know in the, every, in everyone in the UK knows what Centre knows. Parks is. <laughs> it's a phenomenal place to go and have a holiday. And, and it's been a very, it's been an amazing business, even through COVID. And, and now it's doing really well. Um, how do you look at China? So are you deploying capital in China again? We're, it, it's been quite a roller coaster, actually, for, for the economy for the last two years. Yeah, I, look, our, um, our, our business, we invest for clients. And uh, some clients uh, don't want to be investing in China. And some have a very strong interest in investing in China. And therefore, we're still investing for those clients in China and not for the others. And uh, it just depends on what it is, we have a big team uh, in Shanghai and we continue to invest for the clients in China and in Asia and others that want to be investing in China. Um, but so we're, our business is very different than if you, if you own an industrial business and you're trading over a border and you have to make decisions, we take our balance sheet and invest. This is a, a different, different decision for us. Um, Bruce, talk to me about real estate. So there were defaults on two loans. I don't know what that means for, you know, how you see real estate in various parts of the world and the level of distress you're seeing in those. Yeah, yeah I would say that the, there's a real tale of two cities. Firstly, anything that, that's that gone on with us, it's just regular business. This is small and not relevant to the overall business. We have a vast business and everything's financed non-recourse. Um, therefore, it's not really relevant to the overall business. More importantly, what's going on in the world is there's this, um, and it always happens, the best of the best and the worst of the worst. The best of the best today is really, really good. Um, for example, in, in New York, our uh, office buildings we're leasing, Manhattan West, for example, it's a big office complex on the west side of Manhattan. Rents are 50% higher than they were pre-COVID. We're 97% lease. We just leased one full building up of two and a quarter million square feet. We did 3 million square feet of leasing last year. So the high quality 
space is very sought after by companies because they want to bring their people back and have new uh, engaging space. And uh, so that's, that's what's going on. So is that Canary War? I mean, do you have anything similar in the UK or is it a little bit more touch and Look, go? We just, just up the street from where we are here, we just built Hunter Bishop's Gate. Yeah. Uh, it's 100% lease. Rents are way higher than we thought we'd rent at. Uh, we're leasing up Leadenhall up the street from that. Rents are very high. So great space is yeah. achieving great rents. In Dubai, we just leased up a building. It's the best building uh, in Dubai at rents, I'd say double. Yep. what we thought we would rent them for. So iconic, in, in great places, go really well. What's, you know... You know, on the... Look, it's always... It? What's always been that way is if you have poor real estate in poor places, and today poor, before it used to be location. Right. Today it's quality of air systems, yep. quality of uh, everything in the building, layouts, old building, uh, and, and those buildings are, are in trouble. So will you see more like defaults on loans? I don't, and I guess it, it's COVID related. The, part of it is, part of it's just a, 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 a continuation of things going on before COVID just uh, increased it. But I don't think, I'd say real estate in general, the, um, the news out there is much, much worse than the underlying fundamentals. In fact, fundamentals today are, are probably better, almost better than they've ever been going into a recession. Remember in... Uh, when the financial crisis happened, we emptied buildings out in Canary Wharf. Like Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, one day a whole million square foot gone. Today we're 100% leased. So why, why do you see that, that you know, difference between, I guess, perception and reality in your eyes? Is it inflation? Is it interest rates going higher? Don't, don't blame the media. You ask Bruce. me, yeah, I'm going to say it's the media. <laughs> no, of no. course it's not the uh, media. The, uh, we I, report I, the look, facts. Look, I think, uh, I think there's... Um, Real estate has many changes that go on. It's the largest business in the world. Yeah. Remember, it's the largest business in the world. Everyone has a piece of real estate or lives in one yeah. or is near it or they go in it every day. And therefore, everyone has an opinion. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a constantly evolving thing. It's like retail. It's been constantly evolving. Yeah. And, and the trends, the, the negative or positive things get ex exaggerated. Yeah. And uh, I think it just okay. gets exaggerated until it settles down. Um, Bruce, in terms of share buybacks, I know you've been frustrated, right, with, with the, the share price level. Are you going to continue buying back shares when, when it's not good enough? Y yes. The answer is well, the, all uh, company people responsible for companies should look at capital allocation. One of the great things to do is to buy what you own. And uh, we continue to buy back shares in all of our companies when they're not properly valued in the marketplace. And, um, how, do you f how do you define that? Is it you know, like we a just, target? Look, we know, our, we know the assets all the time. And again, I'll go back to price and value. We know what the value is of our business when the price isn't achieving, when the price in the market is higher or lower, we know we should either sell here or buy there. And uh, now, we're running a business, so we can't use all our capital right. to do that. But on the margin over the longer term, uh, it's always really good for shareholders to buy back stock in the company and sink the shares in, in essence, at a, you're buying back what you already own at a discount to the value, and that's highly positive to the owners that are left afterwards. Bruce, thank you so much for a great conversation. The, the first one of many, I hope, so you'll have to come back in the studio. That was the Brookfield Asset Management and Brookfield Chief Executive Officer Bruce Flatt. Now, coming up, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, Stoltenberg on the Ukraine war, U.S.-China tensions, and, of course, the future of the alliance. That interview is coming up shortly. Don't miss that conversation as well. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Federal Reserve officials anticipate more right hikes to curb inflation, though most support slowing down the pace. Minutes from the Fed's meeting three weeks ago say almost all officials agree to an increase of 25 basis points. Only a few were said to have supported a 50-point hike. Now, President Putin says he is waiting for his 
China's Chinese counterpart to visit Moscow. Xi Jinping is reportedly preparing for a trip in April or May to push for multi-party peace talks. China's top diplomat Wang Yi met with Putin in Moscow, calling the relationship between the two countries solid as a mountain. G20 host India is said to be seeking to avoid using the word war in any joint statement which refers to Russia's invasion of Ukraine that would diverge from a consensus reached by leaders in Bali last November. A source says Indian officials would prefer using words like crisis. We're told the hosts are also concerned that plans for additional sanctions on Russia will draw attention from other G20 priorities. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens and this is Bloomberg Francie. Leanne, thank you. Coming up, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg on the Ukraine war, US-China tensions and the future of the alliance. That interview is next and this is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, coming up on today's program, the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, joins us live from Brussels as we approach one year since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Also on the program, could a post-Brexit trade deal on Northern Ireland unleash tens of billions of pounds in business investments for the UK? And the veteran investor and campaigner, Helena Morrissey, tells us about her three-year plan to double the number of female fund managers in Britain. So tomorrow marks one year since Russia launched its war on Ukraine. The invasion has upended security in Europe, placed pressure on NATO, and not seen since the end of the Cold War. So dis to discuss this and much more, I'm very pleased to be joined by the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg. Mr. Stoltenberg, thank you so much for giving a bit of your precious time to Bloomberg. It's a year since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There's no sign of a peace deal. How does Russia think they will win this war? So what we see now is that uh, President Putin is in no way preparing for peace. He is preparing for more uh, war, launching new uh, offensive uh, operations. So uh, we need to support Ukraine to ensure that they prevail as a sovereign independent uh, nation. And uh, uh, this has now become a grinding war of attrition, which is actually a battle of logistics, meaning we need to ensure that they get the ammunition, the fuel, the spare parts and all the, the weapons they need, the Ukrainians, to liberate their, their lands, and that's exactly what the NATO allies and partners are doing. Uh, Secretary General Putin also said in a speech that Russia will, of course, suspend New START, which meaning that there are no treaties governing the nuclear actions of Russia, of the U.S., let alone China. What does that mean for NATO? Does NATO need to do anything to prepare for this? So I regret the decision uh, by Russia to suspend uh, their participation in the New START agreement. This is uh, one of the very last agreements uh, uh, of arms control, um, and the New START agreement is, is an agreement that limits the number of long-range uh, uh, missiles, strategic missiles and weapons. And, uh, and of course, this is, this is a, a reckless decision, because we need arms control. Uh, and we need transparency. Uh, so uh, we call on Russia to uh, to uh, reconsider and to and to respect and to and to fully uh, implement the new START agreement, including the inspection regime, which is extremely important. Uh, and then, of course, we will closely monitor what they fact actually do. Uh, Russia has, over the last years, uh, invested heavily in new modern nuclear capabilities, and uh, we are taking the necessary steps to ensure that our deterrence remains safe and uh, incredible. But does an unregulated nuclear world mean Vladimir Putin is more likely to use nukes? First of all, uh, a world without uh, nuclear arms control uh, arrangements, uh, agreements, um, uh, uh, risks uh, leading to more nuclear weapons. And we need to understand that this is part of a pattern. Uh, not so many years ago, uh, Russia uh, uh, walked away from the INF Treaty, and the INF Treaty banned all intermediate-range uh, 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 weapons. 
uh, and now they are uh, starting to walk away from the new START agreement, uh, banning or regulating the number of, of, uh, of long-range weapons. So more nuclear weapons, of course, makes the world more dangerous. Uh, and that's exactly why we need the, uh, the agreements. That's uh, why, why we need the transparency, the inspection uh, they, they facilitate. And, uh, and, and that's also why the, the Russian decisions to violate the INF Treaty, to, uh, to suspend the uh, New START Treaty, these are uh, reckless and dangerous uh, decisions. Secretary General, um, China looks set to become more engaged in the Ukraine crisis, either through a police plan or, according to us, even through providing arms to Russia. What would the arrival of Chinese weapons on the battlefield mean for NATO? That will be a big and serious mistake uh, by China if they start to provide a little uh, aid to, uh, to Russia. So far, we haven't seen that happening. Uh, but we have seen signs that uh, China uh, is uh, considering uh, to provide uh, military aid to uh, Russia. And, uh, and, and we are watching closely. And of course, China should not do that, because then China will uh, support an illegal war or aggression against a sovereign independent state in Europe, uh, Ukraine. And China, uh, and this will be a blatant violation of the UN Charter, and China is a member of the UN Security Council. So uh, they should not uh, violate the UN uh, uh, Charter. Uh, and, uh, and that's a clear message from, from NATO allies and the United States and, uh, and others. But are you concerned that this for NATO could quickly lead to a proxy war between NATO allies and a Cold War type scenario with Iran, Russia, China and North Korea? First of all, we need to understand what this is. This is a war aggression by Russia against uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and Ukraine has uh, uh, the right to protect and defend itself. Uh, that is a right which is enshrined in the UN Charter. And we, NATO allies, uh, we have the right to support uh, Ukraine. NATO allies are not party to the conflict, but we support Ukraine in upholding the right uh, to defend their own uh, country. Uh, Russia is violating international law. Uh, Russia is, is, is launching uh, this war against uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and Russia is reaching mm -hmm. out to other authoritarian regimes, like Iran. Uh, we have seen the Iranian drones, uh, but also North Korea, to get uh, ammunition, to get uh, weapons, to get uh, uh, support. Uh, and, and again, the, our only answer to that is to ensure that we provide uh, sufficient support to Ukraine so they can prevail and, uh, and push back the, the Russian invaders. And China should not, uh, should not, of course, become part of this by, by, by providing uh, little aid uh, military support to, uh, mm -hmm. to Russia. Um, the challenge and the problem is that China has, has not yet been able to condemn the invasion. Uh, and, and we see how China and Russia are working more and more closely. And of course, this is something which we follow also very closely from the NATO side. Uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, what likelihood do you attach to both Finland and Sweden, uh, Sweden being members of NATO by that mid-July Vilnius summit? I'm confident that both Finland and Sweden will become NATO allies. Uh, all NATO allies, also Turkey, made an historic decision last July at our summit um, in Madrid uh, to invite Finland and Sweden, and all allies also have signed the accession protocols. And so far, 28 out of 30 allies have already uh, ratified. Um, uh, uh, Hungary has uh, made it clear they will ratify uh, the two protocols for Finland and Sweden uh, early March. I welcome that. I met with President Erdogan last week. I see uh, mm -hmm. some encouraging signs. Uh, uh, I think it's absolutely possible to, to, to get Finland ratified in the near uh, future, um, and we continue to work for that. And then uh, on Sweden, there are uh, uh, some more um, uh, challenges that has to be uh, addressed. Uh, but uh, President Erdogan and I agreed last week that uh, uh, there will be a meeting uh, between Finland, Sweden and, uh, and Turkey in Brussels uh, uh, mid-March uh, uh, here at the NATO headquarters uh, and uh, under my auspices. And, and, and they will sit down uh, and meet and, and try to address uh, the challenges we have to overcome to ensure that also uh, Sweden yeah. becomes uh, a full member in the near uh, future. My message has been all the way uh, that uh, that uh, both Finland and F Sweden should be ratified now. They are ready uh, and they should be ratified, but, but uh, Turkey has, uh, has, has another uh, position and therefore we need to find a way to, uh, to solve that issue. 
Mr. Stoltenberg, thank you so much for your precious time. Jens Stoltenberg there, the NATO Secretary General, joining us live from Brussels for an important conversation. Now, for more on the war in Ukraine, William Albuquerque, uh, Director of Strategy, Technology and Arms Control at the International Institute for Strategic <coughs> Studies, also joins us now. William, thank you for joining us. What happens in the next 12 months? How does this war end? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I think what we're going to see, at least in the short term, is the Russians are going to continue this grinding war of attrition, trying to bleed the Ukrainian forces as much as possible. They think they have significant uh, advantages in manpower and in battle tanks, even though they're very old battle tanks, that they're going to use along with artillery to grind the Ukrainian forces down. The breakthrough could come with, battle with the modern Western battle tanks, especially the Leopard 2 battle tanks that have been pledged by so many countries across Europe. These can provide Ukraine with the ability to break through the Russian lines in unpredictable places, to form a real armored core that can spring some strategic surprises on the Russians and throw them back. So we could see in the early spring, mid-spring, into the summer, some Ukrainian counteroffensives that take the Russians by surprise, that throw them backward, and start to bring you, you, Russia back to the position they were at the beginning of the war. Uh, the big question is always going to be Crimea. How can they advance on that front? And I think once Russian forces are being pushed back in the east, then Putin starts to think about how to negotiate his way out of this war. Uh, well, we had a good conversation there with the, the NATO Secretary General, trying to understand also, you know, the, the China fault line. So whether yeah. they're the peace provider, whether they're actually arm Russia, where, where do you think this will go? I, I don't think China wants to get dr dragged into this conflict. I don't think they want to provide Russia with military equipment. I think that's why you hear the noises out of the United States that they're considering exposing some classified information uh, about conversations that are happening in China. Note that the U.S. isn't saying that they're going to expose actual weapons transfers. So the U.S. is trying to do what they've done throughout this conflict, which is the selective use of classified information in order to prevent bad things from happening, whether it's Russian false flag attacks or now the provision of Chinese military equipment. Because if China does provide military equipment, that gives Russia an enormous well of support to draw upon for more missiles, more ammunition, more artillery. Uh, it, would be, it would be very deleterious to the Ukrainian uh, chances for victory. So, where do you see the UK on this? I know there's been a call for the Prime Minister to send uh, some of the, the fighter jets right, to Ukraine. They have promised some longer range weapons. H how crucial is the UK's role in this? Right. Uh, Rishi Sunak promised uh, Storm Shadow, which is a longer range missile that can really help Ukraine start to destroy some of the Russian logistics command and control um, and centers from which they're launching their own missiles and aircraft. So I think that would be a real game changer. I think that would really help um, because if, UK, if the UK starts selling the longer range systems, that may break some of the log jam in the United States where the longer range attackums artillery for the HIMARS has been something that the Ukrainians have been begging for throughout the conflict. So that could really make a difference. All right, thank you so much for joining us. William Albuquerque there with his vast experience, of course, on the ground, Director of Strategy, Technology and Arms Control at the IISS. Coming up, Karen Ward from JP Morgan sees the UK benefiting from an investment boost if a post-Brexit deal is realized. We have the latest on the Brexit talks next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now we're still waiting news for a potential deal between the UK and the EU on changes to post-Brexit trade arrangements for Northern Ireland. But some economists are already looking at the potential upside for investment in Britain when an agreement is reached. Now we're now joined by Bloomberg's UK correspondent Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, uh, great to have you on the program. So what kind of boost can we expect? Well, some economists, Francine, that I've spoken to say that if there were a Northern Ireland protocol deal, it would reduce uncertainty, which would boost investment and then boost growth. So Callum Pickering, who I know you often have on on the programme,
from Berenberg uh, said in a note to clients that actually the uncertainty around a potential trade war with Brussels is hanging over investors and um, they've built up a hundred billion pound war chest of cash since the pandemic. Unlocking a deal might help to uh, get some of that investment into the economy. I also spoke to one of the Chancellor's economic advisors, Karen Ward at JP, Asset, JP Morgan Asset Management yesterday. Take a listen to what she had to say. The numbers are that UK business investment is about the same level that it was in 2016. Uh, the likes of France and Spain, those numbers are around 20% higher. So it would be really meaningful. And of course, with investment then solves all the other economic ills that we have, which is low productivity, low real wages, um, fiscal drag. Uh, so it, it really is the secret source for economists, business investment. So I was quite surprised that Karen Ward would say this to us on Bloomberg Radio yesterday, but it means that the Chancellor clearly is aware of the economic benefits of a deal. What I would say, though, is that Brexit's impacting the economy, not just through business investment, but of course also through the labour market and trade. And business investment isn't just being hampered by Brexit, it's also the tax environment. But if the government could get more growth, potentially it could deliver those tax cuts that so many in the Tory party are after. Now, speaking of the Tory party, what is Labour doing? So we're expecting a big speech in Manchester from Keir Starmer. Yes, it's in the next hour. We're going to see Keir Starmer on his feet at 10.30. At that moment, we're also expecting a document setting out what Labour would do if it were in government. Not quite a manifesto, but the first pledge of five is expected to be that he'll grow the economy to be the fastest growing in the G7. Now, on that pledge, you have to ask, how impressive is it? Because is it more about the pace or is it about the level? And how is he going to do it without boosting immigration, on which he's been really tough in his talk lately? Um, the other goals we reckon will be on the NHS, crime, education, mm -hmm. clean energy. And you might be having deja vu because, of course, the Prime Minister set out his five-point plan uh, for growth earlier, and the, well, his priori priorities earlier in the year, and they both hark back to Tony Blair back in 97. There you go, five points. It's less than six, it's more than three. It's like a beautiful <laughs> number. It kind of sets out the neat. agenda. It is neat and, and it's substantive. Um, talk to me about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Are we going to get a deal? Well, we're currently expecting, hopefully, maybe, they can get a fudge by next week. We heard the Prime Minister at Prime Minister's Questions yesterday sparring with Keir Starmer. Uh, Rishi Sunak suggested that a legal change would be needed to the Northern Ireland Protocol to address this democratic deficit. But we hear uh, constantly from Mara Shevchevich, the European Commission Vice President, that um, it's unrealistic to expect a renegotiation of the protocol. At this point, what people in the Tory party, the Brexiters, want is to see the deal. They're mm. frustrated by this strategy of trying to get them to agree before they see it. But the risk, of course, for Rishi Sunak is if he lays his cards on the table too early there's a big political humiliation that he has to rely on the votes of Labour to get it through Parliament but Keir Starmer clearly trying to coax Rishi Sunak into that checkmate position at uh, PMQs yesterday. Yep a lot going on thank you so much Lizzie Burden and of course we wait for that Keir Starmer speech in about an hour. Now coming up there are fewer than 200 women fund managers in the UK. Veteran investor Helena Morrissey is working on changing that. We'll bring you more of that conversation next and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Actually, Bloomberg UK and Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, despite a push for gender parity in recent years, fund managers in the UK are still overwhelmingly male. There are currently only around 200 female money managers here in the UK. Well, that works out at just one in 10 of the people who run Britain's portfolios. Veteran investor Helena Morrissey is looking to change that. Well, Bloomberg radio anchor Caroline Hepker spoke with the British financier on her new high-intensity mentoring program. And she's here with me. Caroline, it was a great interview. So what exactly is um, Helena Morrissey trying to do? 
Yeah, so Helena Morrissey is the chair of the Diversity Project and they've got this new pathway programme. So we know that the gender diversity numbers in the UK in money management have basically stalled. Last year, according to CityWire, only 12% of people managing money were actually women. That has stayed the same for quite some years. So I spoke to Helena Morrissey around this. The Pathway pro Programme is training up 60 women in the UK this year. Very intensive mm -hmm. programme. And she's clear about what the goal of that is. It's to get those women into money management, but to manage a fund and to be the named person on that fund not just within the team so it's a really ambitious program um, and she wants things to change so have a listen to what she had to say I asked her basically why she thinks the numbers have stayed so stubbornly low I learned from the 30% club experience that was an initiative to create you know better gender balance on boards at least 30% women we only made headway when we involved men in that. Um, and so we do need to be, I love your expression, Caroline, muscular, because it, you know, it should feel very robust. It should be like, a, you've got a business objective here. Let's improve diversity of talent. So Helena Morrissey there um, speaking. So she was talking about the 30% Club, which was one of her previous initiatives. She's had a long career. She has managed money. She sits in the House of Lords. She's the chair of the Diversity Project. The 30% Club was to try to get women on boards um, to increase those numbers for listed businesses up to 30%. So she's using that experience to bring to the Pathway Programme. And as I sort of said to her, you know, this is more muscular. We've had so many initiatives, so much talk about change, but this is very practical. It's about getting these women into the top jobs. And these 60 individuals come from 33 different companies. They are global businesses. So one of the mentors was saying to me, which I thought was very interesting, this isn't just something for the UK. These 33 yeah. investment companies are global businesses. I mean, I, I don't know how much it moves the dial. Certainly, what was, you know, behind her inspiration? So from 200, does she have a target of, of how much she wants that to be? She was quite reluctant to talk about that. <laughs> she said that a lot of people are asking her, is this going to be a permanent program? Is this going to be a global program? She was reluctant to sort of make any commitments. She was saying she's focused on making this year's intake a success. And speaking to the women, which I did for radio, did a whole kind of bespoke piece, which was really fun. Love it back to my reporting days, which I loved. Um, speaking to the, the women who were taking part, the mentees and the mentors, they were quite realistic, a bit sort of pessimistic sometimes about the issue, but also hopeful about this programme. Have a listen again to what Helena had to say. I honestly don't want us to need to have this type of programme in a decade, and I actually think that's within reach. Uh, I saw with the 30% Club that when change starts to happen, it can really accelerate and you get a new sense of what's normal. And you're right, I smiled when you said legacy because it sounds like, you know, they used to call me a veteran, now it's legacy, I'm like beyond the grave next. I mean, I hope this is not sort of, you know, my parting shot, but I've always said, you know, I really don't want to leave this industry until it looks and feels very different. And for me, that means that we have, you know, as many women in it as men, and um, say people expect, if they have a fund manager come and visit them, and if they're a client, they have just as much expectation it's gonna be a woman as a man. Well, thank you so much for that great interview. Of course, great reporting for our Bloomberg Radio anchor, Caroline Hepker. Now, also be sure to subscribe to Bloomberg's In the City podcast that I host alongside uh, David Merritt on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Today's, it's out today, is on a similar theme. Uh, Luke Ellis of Man Group on social mobility in the UK. This is Bloomberg. Should be in a recession right now and it's just not happening the fed doesn't even know we don't know what to look for you're looking at an environment where the fed does need to be tighter we've pretty much annihilated the probability of rate cuts uh towards the end of 2023 and now we're seeing uh you know uh, three rate hikes over the course of the next few months this is bloomberg surveillance early edition with anna edwards and matt miller it's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. The Federal Reserve is inclined toward more interest rate hikes to fight inflation. Still, minutes from the last meeting show almost all Fed officials want the pace of increases to slow down. 
G20 finance ministers meet in India with the war in Ukraine overshadowing their agenda. We'll talk to someone who's there, Spain's Deputy Prime Minister Nadia Calvino. And a push into artificial intelligence processors is helping NVIDIA. Shares are higher after the company comes out with a bullish outlook. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, yes, there's the macro story, there's the post-Fed minutes reaction, but then there's NVIDIA, which really does seem to have reignited the animal spirits. Absolutely. It really pushing us back to risk on, and we've heard so many people in the last few weeks say it's less about the macro picture now and more about earnings that hasn't proven true in terms of market pricing on the indexes. We saw a big drop day before yesterday, the biggest all year and a huge jump in rates, all due to um, Fed speak and uh, continued inflation data. PPI was really what set that off. But now maybe earnings are really going to come into focus. Take a look at S&P futures, up about four-tenths of 1%. Uh, the index, the, the cash trade, really didn't drop too much yesterday. And we did have a rise in the NASDAQ again. The NASDAQ is up still more than 10% year-to-date, while the S&P is only up about 4% year to date. The U.S. 10-year yield um, had come off a little bit. Now it's up another two basis points, but still 393.71 is a little bit lower than where we saw it at this time yesterday. And NYMEX crude is also coming back a little bit, but itself a little lower than we saw it at this time yesterday. 74.17 for a barrel of West Texas Intermediate. Finally, Bitcoin at 24,299 is just about exactly where it was 24 hours ago. But what astonishes me is the lack of volatility in this digital asset. We really didn't see it come down with the latest uh, move in equities or in yields. It just has managed to stay at the same level. Take a look at what's going on in Asia. We are going to talk to the CEO of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange a little bit later on in the program. The MSCI Asia uh, Pacific X Japan index rising a quarter percent X Japan because Japan is closed for a holiday today. So you won't see a quote on uh, the Nikkei that's any different than yesterday. The Hang Seng in Hong Kong down a third of 1% at 20,351. Um, we're looking at some more weakness in the U.S. dollar versus the Korean won. This is interesting after a pause uh, for the central bank there because we had seen the dollar really strengthening again against the yuan, and now it's coming off a little bit. So if you watch this pair, that's a turnaround. And the dollar strengthening against the yen right now at 134.85. Anna, what do you see in terms of uh, Europe? Well, here in Europe, then, we see a pretty pi uh, mixed picture across European equity markets. Uh, uh, geographically speaking, at least, Matt, we've got weakness coming through in the London market. Basic resources in the mining sector, partly responsible there. The auto sector and technology doing well, and that plays well for the German market. So we see the German and the French markets on the rise. A quick data point for you. We just got euro area core inflation, and this is the core number, accelerating to a record of 5.3% against an estimate of 5.2. So not much over the estimate. And this is core. This is not the head headline figure, which has come off those recent highs, as we've seen in other geographies. But it's the core number that is still advancing, is still going higher. And that, no doubt, a bit of a headache for uh, those at the ECB. Here's the moving technology shares that we're seeing up by 1.2%. Maybe it's the, that NVIDIA story helping to lift sentiment surrounding that sector. Anglo-American is partly responsible for the weakness in basic resources, but it's been a theme of this week. Earlier this week, we heard from Rio Tinto. We heard from BHP. Both of those businesses seemingly disappointing the markets with the amount of money they're returning to shareholders and some, to some degree, the numbers. Anglo-American, some similar stories, but with some differences. A, a big uh, impairment charge. They're having to take on part of their fertilizer business in the UK. Rolls-Royce, a completely different story. And this is incredible move for a business uh, like Rolls-Royce. The engine-making business, of course, not cars, up by 18.9% here in the UK today. Wow. And they beat estimates. They're talking about the strength in their operations under a relatively new CEO. They're talking about transformation and the strategy and also possibly about return of cash to shareholders. And so all of that adding to some upside on that particular share price. And this is the UK 30-year yield. I just put that in here as we're keeping track of where we are on the yield story. As we're seeing various curves adjusting to this higher for longer mantra that the market seems to be coming round to, we're kind of back to where we started the year on the UK 30-year yield. And actually the UK a bit of an outlier today in Europe, seeing those yields go just a touch higher.
amazing to see that Rolls Royce move. I mean, a $10 billion business gaining a fifth overnight on uh, possible strategic changes is huge, a huge story. Let's get, though, back to the macro picture. The minutes from the latest Fed meeting show the central bank is inclined toward more interest rate hikes to curb inflation if you hadn't already woken up to that. Meanwhile, New York Fed President John Williams says it's critical the central bank stay committed to its 2% inflation goal. Price stability is, in fact, the foundation of economic prosperity. Without price stability, uh, all of the other goals that we have, whether maximum employment or low and stable uh, or low interest rates, can't be accomplished. So that's an absolute imperative for us. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel joins us now for the key takeaways from the Fed minutes. And Valerie, I thought, you know, one of the most interesting things was the minutes uh, seem more hawkish than Powell did at the presser. There was no talk, for example, of a pause, and he wasn't very firm about that. Yeah, also, Matt, there was no mention of the word disinflation, which he seemed to say ad nauseum in that Q&A. But let me go back to a few things. The first one for me was that only a few wanted a 50 basis point hike. That implies that Bullard and Messer maybe only had one friend in that 50 basis point camp. The market took a sigh of relief on that one. But on the hawkish side, there was no mention of a pause. And as I said, there was no mention of this word disinflation. Instead, there was a big emphasis on maintaining the restrictive stance. And then lastly, for me, they only focused on the upside risk to inflation, saying that that's key to their policy. We had a pretty, we had some soft CPI prints heading into this January Fed meeting. Some suppose there would be some focus on the downshot, uh, downside risk to inflation, but there wasn't. This all goes to say that there has been a 50 basis point shift higher in the Fed's terminal rate, somewhat implying that the March dots do have room to move higher when the Fed convenes again on March 22nd. Yeah, that's interesting because I ask questions about the extent to which the market has already front run the hawkishness we saw there or whether there's more to come. On to other matters to do with the Fed then, Valerie. Vice Chair Leo Brainard departs the Fed this week. This has crept up on me uh, more quickly than expected. Any hints on who's going to replace her in this key seat? Anna, there was a report out from the Wall Street Journal that named two names, both economists who have previously worked in the Obama administration. I want to talk about Janice Eberly here real quick. In 2019, she co-authored a piece that found that a 3% inflation target would have been better in the aftermath of the global financial crisis to aid recovery. It's very clear from these initial uh, 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 rumored picks from Biden that he is looking for a dove to replace Lael Brainerd in that vice chair seat. Okay, Valerie, thanks very much. Certainly want to watch Bloomberg's Valerie Titel with uh, news on the markets and key appointments. Let's get over to the, the uh, tech space. NVIDIA is edging higher in U.S. pre-market trading after it gave a bullish revenue outlook for the current quarter. The push into artificial intelligence processes is helping offset sluggish demand for PC chips. Joining us now on this and other tech news, Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie with the details. Tom, uh, good morning to you. So yeah. what can you tell us about these results? So it's the guidance, particularly the first quarter leading up to April. They're expecting sales of about six and a half billion US dollars, well above the estimates. And as you say, that is impingent or at least contingent on what they see as that's demand for AI chips. And as you say as well, of course, a key revenue driver for NVIDIA has been the gaming part of the business, gaming chips. But what they've successfully managed to do, it seems, is pivot from gaming to AI using those chips that are well versed in terms of crunching the data for AI applications and that's where they're seeing the demand. They also announced that they're setting up an AI cloud service in partnership with the likes of Microsoft, Oracle and Google so that could be another revenue driver going forward. Just for the context, Nvidia is one of the best performing, in fact the best performing chip company within the Philly index. It's going to more than 40% year to date and again investors rewarding this company on this upbeat guidance. All right, AI um, certainly hot this earnings season. Yeah. Um, in terms of a, a much longer term bet, Apple apparently making headway on its glucose tracking watch, which, Tom, I think is fascinating as the growth of diabetes is monstrous globally, and this would allow them to test your blood le uh, sugar levels without, you know, a pinprick. Yeah, and as you say, look, this is an enormous potential market. So one in 10 Americans alone suffering from diabetes. So what are we talking about? About 40 million 
people. Yes, you're also right to say this has been a long-running project, more than 12 years, highly secretive as well. And what they're trying to do is use the hardware that Apple has its, at its disposal with the software to do this non-invasive, and as you rightly point out, that's key to this, non-invasive blood glucose testing. So they use photosonic, things called silicon photo, photonics, which is a part of chip, a chip technology, silicon photonics with lasers and with their own algorithms to measure glucose levels. They say they're at proof of concept level. They're still a number of years away from getting this onto the market. They need to shrink it. That's going to be key for them. They're at the point now where they're trying to get this product down to about the size of an iPhone to put onto your bicep uh, to measure these glucose levels. But as you say, we're a number of years away. They said they've had some major successes. It's been cloaked in secrecy, but the market potential is clearly huge for them. OK, Tom, thanks very much. Being based on McKenzie with those tech themes for us. Back to the geopolitics. India is hosting the G20 finance chiefs meeting this week. US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's comments at the gathering mark a shift in tone on the global economic outlook from the last time the world's top policymakers met in October. It's fair to say that the global economy is in a better place today than many predicted just a few months ago. In the fall, many were worried about a sharp economic slowdown across the world. The challenges we face are real, and the future is always uncertain. But the outlook has improved since we gathered in the fall. U.S. Treasury Secretary there talking about the improving outlook. We're joined by Bloomberg's Haslinda Armen, who is going to be speaking to Spain's Deputy Prime Minister at the G20 meeting. Haslinda, good morning. Well, Anna, the world economy may be in a better place, but there are lots of challenges, including debt restructuring. 60% of developing nations are either in debt distress or close to it, so it is a huge issue. Let's get perspective from Spain's uh, first uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Good to have you with us, ma'am. Uh, we talk about debt restructuring. It's a huge issue here, and some say that perhaps China is dragging its feet. I mean, where are we in terms of progress? Debt restructuring is undoubtedly a very important element, uh, a key tool to provide financial support to most vulnerable countries, as you say. And there are many discussions ongoing in different fora, and I hope that we manage to find a, a breakthrough, including also private sector participation, of course. But some say there needs to be some tweaking in the common framework. I mean, what can be done? At the end of the day, what we need is the will of all the key creditors. They must all contribute so that we manage to provide this debt relief to most vulnerable countries and thus reinforce the whole financial safety net. The thing is, the US, um, even India, they want China to take a haircut. But China says for them to take a haircut, it wants the World Bank to do it as well. Should the World Bank take a haircut as well? We need to have a broad and balanced approach because we cannot endanger the AAA and, the, and the, the, the role of the World Bank and the IMF as lenders of last support. We cannot weaken the multilateral framework in this discussion. So that's why I was saying we need to all get together and find a balanced and the right approach that provides relief without weakening the common safety net. We heard from uh, US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen just like the earlier. She's also pushing for reform. Uh, to the World Bank. She says that the World Bank needs to expand its balance sheet, for instance. The World Bank currently is undergoing a leadership change. Who would you like to see there? Should we see yet mm -hmm. another American? Oh, <laughs> well, I wouldn't get into that discussion. I think the most important issue is not so much the person, but rather uh, what kind of structure and multilateral framework do we think we need going forward? Actually, our frameworks have served as well to respond to the pandemic through good coordination of monetary and fiscal policies and the strong role of the World Bank and the IMF. We have prevented a massive uh, financial crisis as happened you know, in 20, 2008. And so we need to continue to reinforce our multilateral framework with the uh, institutions based in Washington and other development banks throughout the world so that we can ensure financial stability and therefore strong sustainable growth. Uh, leadership does matter. Countries like Indonesia, India feel that it is time for someone from the developing world to be leading the World Bank. After all, if you take a look at growth, 80% of growth this year will come from developing nations. Shouldn't that be reflected in organizations like the World Bank, like the IMF? Well, obviously, right now we are in a, in a tectonic shift, you know, of the common world order that has served us since the end of World War II. 
I think there are many changes and also geopolitical challenges and tensions are, are taking place, mostly due to the war in Ukraine most recently. I think that we definitely need to see how to build, how to put the building blocks of this new world order and countries such as India have a strong voice and have an important role to play and that's, that's for sure and I'm very glad that the G20 is taking place in India because I think that can help us uh, find a way forward in many of the challenges of the present and the future. Mm. Speaking of Ukraine, we're marking the first-day milestone uh, tomorrow. Uh, we know that the EU has frozen uh, quite a lot of uh, Russian assets and are considering investing those assets to help the reconstruction in Ukraine. Your thoughts on that and where the process is right now? Mm. Well, yeah, one year after the beginning of the pandemic, actually, President Sanchez from Spain, he's visiting Kiev today. Uh, and I will this afternoon be signing uh, the Spanish contribution to the new World Bank Fund to support investment into the health infrastructures of Ukraine, saving lives. Huh? So this is very important. We continue to support Ukraine. I think that the, the major development would be if the war would end, because the war is right now the main element of uncertainty and concern at global level with a long, long lasting and, and a broad impact throughout the world. And so the sooner it ends, the, the better, because then we can resume the, the path of a strong, uh, balanced growth uh, that we were on after the pandemic. Now, uh, we will have to think about the reconstruction indeed, but I think right now our focus should be on ending the war as soon as possible. But should those frozen assets be invested for re reconstruction efforts is it even legal? Where are conversations? Well, this is an issue that uh, will have to be considered as many other elements when the moment comes. I think that right now the focus should be on ending the war as soon as possible and supporting Ukraine uh, through uh, investments like the one I just mentioned in, in health infrastructures, in the basic elements for people to leave. I mean, this war has already taken too many lives and we should stop it as soon as possible. Mm. Earlier we talked about uh, inflation, how it remains sticky. It is one of the huge issues for uh, central bank governors right now. Inflation, food inflation in particular in Spain remains high. Uh, how, what are the efforts? How will you contain those prices? Well, luckily, I mean, Spain has had a very strong recovery after the pandemic with 5.5% uh, 5 5 .5 GDP growth in 2021 and 22. And 2023 also looks good. I mean, the outlook is, is quite positive. We started the year with very strong job market performance. And so Spain will probably be the fastest and strongest growth growing country in the EU among the large economies, and that's good news. Indeed, we, the inflation started to surge already in 2021. Luckily, last year, thanks to energy prices going down and also the many measures we, we took, we managed to bring it down five percentage points in five months. And Spain now has the lowest inflation rate in, in the EU. We must continue that track. Uh, some of your coalition partners are suggesting perhaps you should limit the prices of some products. Is that something you're considering? Why not do that? Well, we took measures end of December, which have started to have kicked in in January. They are already proving to be effective to bring food prices down. This is a top priority, obviously, because food prices affect uh, the health and, and the well-being of families. And so we've provided support to the families, also support to most affected sectors by the energy price surge. And uh, we need to see the development and the impact of these measures we took before, before taking other measures going forward. So far, I think we got it right to respond to the pandemic. We are also getting it right to respond to the impact of the crisis. And we should continue to take good measures uh, without negative side effects. So what's the biggest global risk that could put Spain's position at stake? As I was saying, the outlook is relatively comfortable, uh, positive, I would say, not comfortable, positive, uh, even in this very complex international scenario, because we have very strong consumption growth, investment, also exports are performing extraordinarily, in particular non non-tourism sector and, and services are performing very well. And we are also undertaking a massive investment and reform program, which is also modernizing our country, making it more greener, uh, digital, having stronger sustainable growth going forward. So the outlook is relatively positive, And I think we need to continue to take the right measures and provide a European and a global response to global challenges. The thing is the Fed remains hawkish and that could mean a stronger dollar. How are you assessing the risk from from that. 
I hope they get it right. I hope central bankers get, get it right on both sides of the Atlantic and, and throughout the world. They have to get it right so that they manage to cut down inflation without endangering growth more broadly because uh, sustainable growth is of the essence if we want to also prevent a financial crisis and support growth in most vulnerable countries. It all has to come together in a positive sense like we did when responding to the pandemic. Minister, thank you so much for that. Minister Nadia Calvino there. We're coming to you live from uh, Bangalore at the G20 uh, meeting for finance ministers and central bank governors. Anna, handing back to you. Has Linda, thank you very much. Bloomberg's has Linda Armin speaking with the Deputy Minister, uh, Prime Minister of Spain. Coming up on this programme, we will talk about trading activity. The Hong Kong Exchange is finally seeing some relief. We'll discuss earnings uh, with the CEO, Nicolas Aguzan. That conversation coming up shortly. And we'll also speak to Rebecca Minghella, founder and CEO of Clarity AI. We'll talk about the meeting point between that fast-growing, uh, much-hyped, perhaps, technology, but also ESG goals. That uh, conversation later this hour. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The Federal Reserve is inclined toward more interest rate hikes to fight inflation. Still minutes from the last meeting show almost all Fed officials want the pace of increases to slow down. The Hong Kong Exchange says earnings rose after six straight quarters of declining profits. We will be joined by the CEO, Nicholas Aguzan. And a push into artificial intelligence processors is helping NVIDIA. Shares are higher after the company comes out with a bullish outlook. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, clearly we've seen a lot of talk around the minutes and what the minutes told us, if anything new, given we've had a lot of data, hawkish data, since those minutes were put together from the last Fed meeting. And then there's the micro stories around tech earnings, in particular NVIDIA. Yeah, I think um, those are uh, two different stories. Although, um, you know, it's interesting, the minutes seem to tell us that the Fed was on top of this uh, lack of disinflation or um, the slowdown in the slowdown of inflation. So they were more hawkish than Powell at, at his press conference, but in line with the Fed speakers we've heard thus far. In terms of earnings, the NVIDIA results leading the market higher. You can see the S&P futures right now about four-tenths of one percent. Um, we did have a big jump in yields, and right now we're up another three basis points, but still we're lower than we were at the peak of this jump, so um, that's less of a headwind for stocks. Right now, the 10-year yielding 394.49. In terms of oil, we're gaining again on WTI, uh, 48 cents a barrel to 74.43. It's still lower than it was at this point 24 hours ago, um, but you have had oil just hanging around this zone uh, lately as we wait for more data out of China to confirm whether or not that um, reopening is going to be reflationary and then or how reflationary it'll be. And then Bitcoin not moving very much at all, 24,292. Take a look at uh, some of the pre-market movers. NVIDIA is one of the big ones um, jumping after it gave what was really a bullish outlook in terms of its revenue after the bell yesterday suggesting that a push into AI processors is helping to offset sluggish demand for PC uh, chips. So, you know, they're on the AI bandwagon. It's serving them well. Investors are happy about it to the tune of 8% before the market opened. Lucid Group, on the other hand, the maker of EVs, plunging after posting worse than expected results and the company's deliveries were much lower than anticipated. 1,932 sedans delivered in the fourth quarter. That was well short of the 2,831. That was the, the average of analyst estimates. Um, you know, they wanted to make 20,000 cars last year. Now they're expecting to make 10 to 14,000 this year. And then Meta, you can see it's not moving much right now, half a percent in uh, the, the pre-market. But watch after the Washington Post reported Facebook the Facebook owner plans to cut thousands of jobs. The WAPO cited people familiar on that story. Meta spokesman Andy Stone later said in a tweet that the Washington Post got this one wrong. Still, Zuckerberg has been talking up a boost in efficiency, and that may lead investors to believe that reporting. Anna, what do you see in Europe? 
Yeah, we certainly saw that focus on efficiency really delivering for the Meta share price in uh, just just after we got that uh, that that call from uh, from Zuckerberg. This is what we see in Europe then. To answer your question, Matt, European equity markets up by a tenth of a percent, not by much. A real divergence across the European space, though, dependent on uh, which markets you're focused on. The stock 600 technology uh, index goes higher. That's the Nvidia effect in part, up by just over one percent, doing well for Germany. Then Anglo-American weighing on the London market down by 2.7 percent, and they were announcing into a market that's already been disappointed by mining companies this week. We heard from Rio and BHP, both of those disappointed. Anglo-American disappointing a little for different reasons, taking a big charge on one of their projects, a fertilizer project in the UK. That seems to be dominating the conversation there. And Rolls-Royce, this is the engine maker, and that company, the shares are up by 22%. The more their engines fly, the more maintenance money they earn. And so that is good for the business. But it's also the new CEO uh, talking about a strategic change at the business, wow. returning cash to shareholders. The new CEO has been 20 years also at BP and so there seems to be a lot of expectation about what can be delivered and delivered for shareholders there Matt. Yeah very high expectations look like with a 22 percent gain. Uh, fascinating stuff. Let's get to the business of trading shares. Hong Kong Exchange is finally seeing some relief after six straight quarters of sliding profits. The exchange reported an 11 percent increase in fourth quarter profit. Um, it joins us now to, well, the CEO joins us now to talk more about the results in the trading environment. Nicholas Agazine joins us. Thank you so much. Great to have you on the program, Nicholas. Uh, let me first ask you about, you know, your results in, and, and really the outlook in terms of the trading picture. What do you expect for this quarter? What do you expect for this year in terms of volatility, turnover, just the broader trading environment? Thank you, Matt. Good morning. Um, clearly, the, the numbers of the fourth quarter were good in the sense that it's our best fourth quarter ever. And uh, to your question of what to expect going forward, the key variable that we're watching carefully is what's happening with the China reopening trade in the sense that we've seen that that has been much faster than expected. And so when we look at volumes, for example, in January, the average volumes were around 140 billion Hong Kong dollars per day, average daily traded volume. That compares with about 125 that we had throughout the year last year. So they, that slowed down a little bit in February. But um, what we were, were probably expecting is that it'll be moving you know, up and down a, a bit. But the, the natural trend is that investors are quite bullish on the fact that this, this, this uh, reopening is going to generate quite a bit of growth from this part of the world. And many investors that had trimmed their position in the past, they're looking at perhaps catching up uh, with, with, with the, the slightly shorter position that they had. How quickly do you expect the reopening to accelerate, Nicholas? You know, in this quarter, in this year, we're just hearing, uh, I just heard a report this morning that um, the mask mandate has been extended in Hong Kong. I think uh, I heard through March. Um, nonetheless, that doesn't seem to bode well um, if, you're ex if you're extending these kind of requirements. How does it look from, from your vantage point? Well, Ho Hong Kong is fully open at this point. I mean, there's a lot of visitors coming from all over the world. It's in some cases hard to get even hotels and restaurants are like full. So, so what we're seeing is that Hong Kong is very active. Clearly, a lot of what's happening in Hong Kong is people are actually participating in a lot of what's going on in, in the overall China. And uh, that's what's generating a lot of interest. We're also seeing a lot of people from um, China and, and, and also within Hong Kong going internationally to Middle East. I mean, I've been there a couple of times, I mean, throughout like uh, US, Europe. So there's a lot more connectivity. And we think that is really, really good for the role that we play, which is actually creating that connectivity between East and West. We're at the bridge. And uh, Hong Kong historically has been known for its connectivity, for its liquidity and the opportunities that we provide. Now, on top of that, we're adding new products and we're having new, new uh, diversification that we didn't have in the past. So more than the results okay. itself, I'm excited about all the infrastructure. Excited about the infrastructure. And are you excited about the IPO pipeline as well, Nicolas? That seems to have picked up at the same time as the China reopening story gathered momentum. And we've seen at the fourth quarter a little better on that front. What does the pipeline look like for this year? 
Um, yes, you, you're absolutely right, Anna. It, the second half saw four times more IPOs than the first half. And even though it was a difficult year globally for equity fundraising, in Hong Kong we had 90 IPOs. So 90 companies decided to list last year. In the first month of the year, which was January, already priced 10 IPOs. And for the rest of the year, we have somewhere around 90 that are already filed and are waiting to, fee, to be approved. And, and, and there's a lot of interest in this new chapter that we are creating. It's called the Specialist Technology Chapter, which will address companies that have very little revenues, but great value, great investment in research and development, etc. Uh, Nicholas, can you tell us any more on the IPO front? Update us on your pursuit of the Saudi Aramco IPO, either the specifics around it or the guiding principles you're following as you push for that business. The, the interesting thing, and, and I can't talk about individual cases, but let me tell you about like companies in the Middle East, about companies uh, around the world that may want to use Hong Kong as a fundraising hub. Hong Kong, as a result of recent changes in regulation, is the only market in the world where you can have capital raise and then you can eventually have investors, not only international investors, but also domestic investors from the mainland. And this is something very unique because in no other market in the world that you can have access to an uncorrelated investor base, both the onshore investors and mostly retail investors that are very aggressive, but also all the international investors that obviously are located in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very international city with like all the big houses from around the world. So it's the only market that can actually provide that. So we're seeing a lot of interest from international companies that are asking about how do I do this? How do I play a role here? So very excited about that possibility. You talk about the infrastructure, Nicholas, and I know you've been spearheading plans to, um, uh, to strengthen your infrastructure so that you can trade through typhoons, through big rainstorms. You're not in that season, I think, until the summer, but when you do get there, um, typically the Hong Kong Exchange will close five, six, seven times a year. Um, are you going to be able this year to go through that? Since everyone works from home now anyway, or, or can work from home, um, will we see no more typhoon holidays at the HKEX? Yeah. So I, I think you, you, you highlighted a good point. There, there's a lot of things that we've learned through COVID, people working from home. What we're saying is we want to be an internationally competitive market. We want to make sure that people can trade when the international markets are open. And how can we do this at the same time? We don't want to put anyone's life at risk during a typhoon or a, you know, a heavy rain period. So we have to make sure that we're very thoughtful about the impact that that can have in the community and the people around. So we'll do it through a consultation. We'll interact with all the stakeholders. We just want to make sure that we continue progressing we make this a first class you know, market for everyone and, and everyone continues to be safe. Thanks so much for joining us, Nicolas. Nicolas Aguzan, the Hong Kong Exchange CEO. Coming up on the program, Rebecca Minghella joins us, founder and CEO of Clarity AI, where ESG themes meet with that hot new technology. We'll talk about that. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Uh, now, there have been a lot of headlines recently about how artificial intelligence, AI, is reshaping uh, the way that business operates, the way that all kinds of businesses operate. Joining us now is Rebecca Minghella, founder and CEO of Clarity AI, a sustainability technology platform. And Re Rebecca comes to us just for, from the London Stock Exchange, where you've been uh, opening today's trading. So, Rebecca, welcome to the programme. Thanks for joining us. So, sustainability and technology, you, your business sits at the sort of intersection of both of those. You use AI to help investors work out where to put their money, essentially. Um, are we getting much closer to defining exactly what sustainable investments look like? Or is, because we still seem to be in the midst of those conversations. Yeah, so, uh, well, fortunately, we, we are getting closer to a, a better definition of sustainability. That's why regulations like the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, SFDR, um, is helping defining the sustainability so much better and helping investors 
to also label and, and, and mm. their, their funds and make better disclosures. Today, as, as you said, we announced a very large partnership with the London Stock Exchange precisely to help investors define sustainability better and use better data and tools mm. to make their sustainability assessment easier. Right? And, and, and in terms of some of that labelling, in Europe we have these uh, different ESG fund classes and we've seen, your research has, has shown, that a, a lot of fund managers are suddenly pretty sceptical about Article 9 uh, funds, which is the sort of top-rated ESG fund class. Why are we seeing that scepticism around those top ratings? Uh, more than scepticism, what we see is that, well, to give some context, Article uh, 9 and Article 8 are the definitions of the SFDR regulation in Europe uh, to help investors uh, disclose how sustainable the funds are. So Article 8 are what is called the light uh, green uh, funds and Article 9 is dark green funds. So Article 9 is more strict of mm. a definition of sustainability. And what, we've had, what we have seen in the last few months is that investors have been downgrading Article 9 funds, so the more strict sustainability definitions, to Article 8, which means that they see or they, they are a bit more concerned about how they are disclosing sustainability and they mm. are trying to be more strict about how they define sustainability, right? Which Re is good news. Mm. Rebecca, Matt. don't investors at this point still have to do pretty much all their own research when it comes to ESG? Um, I was talking recently to someone who runs an ESG ETF, supposedly ESG, with big holdings of Exxon and Coca-Cola in it. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. So don't investors have to decide for themselves what they believe represent, well represents ESG? I think that's a great question. There is some uh, confusion in the market about what ESG really means because it's a term that has been used uh, too broadly and, and aggregating too many different concepts. So the first misconception to your question is could an, an oil and gas company w be, uh, have a good ESG score, right? And, and the reality is that many of the ESG scores ha are based uh, on a best-in-class classification, meaning that the best oil and gas company, according to certain sustainability criteria, could actually uh, have a good ESG uh, score. The other thing that uh, is a misconception is that ESG is usually uh, used more to assess risk linked to sustainability more than actual sustainability or outcomes or impact. So again, that's why an oil and gas company with a lower risk linked to sustainability could also be performing well on ESG metrics, right? What do you see in terms that, of no. growth, Rebecca, say for this year or next, in terms of the, to the total industry? Because there's been such a backlash in anti-ESG, it's often termed anti-woke, you know, backlash at least here in the U.S., and I imagine it reverberates around the world. Yes, I mean, there is definitely some backlash on ESG. The, the trend is clear. The volume of assets under management going into sustainability, or, well, sustainable investing uh, keeps growing. So that's a reality. According to any metrics or any measures, it keeps growing. There is, of course, certain backlash in the U.S., I think. Partly it's understandable. Uh, I believe we should move away from, from politicizing uh, the sustainable investing trend. I think we should all agree that in the long term we all want a better society, a better planet. So I think trying to politicize um, this uh, sustainable investing trend um, is not the right approach. But the most important thing is that what we want is in any case be able to provide data and tools. So all the investors have more, more clarity, but not intended, on, um, on, uh, on what the strategy that they want to follow, whatever yes. the strategy is, right? Uh, yes, it certainly has a very political, specifically U um, a US political dimension, yeah. doesn't it, over there, which maybe doesn't, uh, hasn't translated entirely around the world. Let me ask you about the AI part of the business. I mean, it, you said it there, Clarity AI. AI is in the name, and clearly this is a hot topic right now. Yeah. We saw it just overnight with the results from NVIDIA. Chat GPT is just everywhere. People talking about AI all over the place. Having it in the name, I mean, being a business that has been dealing in this kind of technology for a while, the fact that it's having such a moment, does that open doors for you more? Are doors opening more easily now than they were? Definitely. So one of the one of the ways, well, we use uh, AI in, in several ways. One is natural language processing to make sure that we process information, capture data in a more scalable way. Also news, um, uh, we process news much faster and in a much bigger scale than an analyst uh, can do. Uh, we also use um, machine learning 
for, to do estimation models for CO2 emissions. And definitely any trend that is focusing on more adoption on any of those technologies and therefore the, the excitement about our partnership with large financial platforms like the London Stock Exchange means that more and more these large platforms want to partner with smaller players like us that are more agile and more flexible right, to be able to, to, to deliver those, those solutions and those new technologies. Right? Can, can uh, AI help you to avoid pitfalls that we've seen recently with ESG uh, problems involving greenwashing? Uh, definitely. So basically what it's helping with is uh, data reliability. So analyzing data at a scale, checking the reliability of the data, being able to do a severity assessment as well, and again, everything at a scale um, with algorithms instead of using analysts. And, and at the same time, we of course avoid any biases that, uh, that an analyst might uh, my hub, right, on a specific companies or investments. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Rebecca Mingela uh, of Clarity AI. And apologies for some of the background newsroom uh, noise, but uh, sometimes people uh, we sing. with it. That they do. It, it appears so. Uh, coming up on the programme, we'll run you through the market-moving events. I mean, I don't sing very often in the newsroom, but others do. Matt often sings. I can uh, definitely confirm that. We'll look at uh, the events that are coming up in your trading day ahead. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Now a look at what is ahead today at 6 a.m. Eastern time. We get the Turkish rate decision. Turkey may cut interest rates to the lowest in seven years, adding a missing piece to its emergency response, perhaps, after the country's worst earthquake disaster in a century. At 8.30 a.m., we will get the second reading of U.S. GDP data, as well as initial jobless claims numbers. And a lot of people focus on those as a sort of real-time indicator on the, the labor market. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic and San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly will both be speaking. After the bell, we will get earnings from Booking.com and also from Beyond Meat. And I know that you've been reflecting on the housing market, Matt. Yeah, I have because we had data out um, showing yesterday showing that uh, prices have dropped 5% across the U.S., the biggest drop that we've seen since 2008. And uh, it, it feels like there's just so much more to come, Anna, because if you mm. look across, I mean, just anecdotally around this area, there's still seemingly unaffordable um, housing markets, especially with rates at the level that they are. Uh, so yeah. the worry is that prices have further to fall. Yeah, absolutely. And, and our story points out that even with that drop, the total value of homes remains roughly $13 trillion higher than it was in February 2020, to your point about, about affordability. And that's really a focus here in the UK as well. Yes, we're focused on the extent to which prices might drop, and that is very much the conversation. But still, we see, even with small drops in places, we still see unafford unaffordable homes. In fact, some people at Schroeder's cr crunching the numbers, Matt, and the, the uh, house prices in the UK as unaffordable or well, the last time they were this unaffordable you have to go back to 1876 18 that number starts with oh. to find a period i don't know how you get the data but there is data that goes back that far which is impressive i'm sure it's available on the bloomberg terminal that is it for the early edition surveillance is ahead with tom john and lisa they'll be speaking uh, to the co-ceo of uh, gabelli funds this is bloomberg